I don't know about you guys, but I'm already glad I showed up this morning. The presence of God's wonderful. And I was debating this morning about whether to go on where we have been studying biblical authority. But God began to speak some things into my heart about Purim this morning. And I always kind of put up my antenna, if you will, to make sure that I'm delivering not what I'd necessarily want to do in my plans of things, but I always make sure God's free to interrupt our regularly scheduled program, if you will, (laughs) to give a word from our sponsor. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Esther, chapter 4 and verse 14. And I want to look at how to survive the things that are coming. How many know that we, we, we have two things going on right now? You are, how many know things are getting bad? It's amazing to me at some of the things, just as far as inflation goes, some of the uh, family size bags that used to be family size, now it's like calling it jumbo shrimp. Because the, the bags that used to be like this are now like this, and they're still calling it family size for a very small family. And we look at what's going on in the world, and we know the devil's up to something. There are some things going on, and everybody seems to be closing their eyes and saying, it's not bad, it's not bad, let's just keep spending. That happens to be the way of Washington, D.C. and the EU. Have you ever tried to spend yourself out of debt and it worked? I've tried that, and for some reason, all of a sudden, the debt just keeps going up, and we think, well, I like it when you reduce your spending, increase your income, budget things, and watch the debt go down. I want the credit card to say zero balance. I want the mortgage to say zero balance. The bigger the number, the worse things are. Has anybody ever looked at the national deficit here lately? It's running like Speedy Gonzalez. And we know there are things going on. And so we, we have the potential of things getting very, very bad. But at the same time, one of the things God is saying is if we'll follow him, it can get very, very good. And I want to get into the very, very good. I'm tired of the very, very bad. And I'm getting tired of oscillating between very good and very bad. Sometimes you feel like a ping pong ball, don't you? Good for a little bit, boing, bad for a little bit, boing, good for a little Let's just get stuck over on good and learn how to move in that. And part of the Purim story is, that you see, the, God uses the feast as divine rehearsals. And, uh, and in fact, well, let's, let's read Esther 4.14. For, I'm getting re- I'm ready to preach ahead of myself. How many know that's bad? I need to stay with the program here. And this is Mordecai telling Esther some things and giving her counsel, and she's got a decision to make. And here's what he says, And if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall there be enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thy and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And I want you to underline the next one. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? How many know God placed Esther at a specific place at a specific time for a specific purpose? And we are placed at a specific time for a specific purpose by the hand of God. And we need to understand some of the challenges that we're facing. Maybe, just maybe, if we'll have the boldness that we're supposed to have in God and move in God and not in this world, that we are brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. Every one of us, guys, I I, I have seen us there. There are pivotal places in our lives that if you're really online with God, you move to a new level. In fact, I was talking with a minister this week, and, and it's surprising how the, that there, there are ministers out there that believe everything just exactly the way I do. We get on the phone, it's almost like revival. We say, I can't believe you believe the same stuff we do. Yeah, we do. And we, we get to preaching back and forth. It's like, boy, this, uh, boy, if we get a whole bunch of us together, we'd really have church, wouldn't we? You know, and Instead of people looking at you like, you know. So you don't believe in a free trip rapture, you, you keep the feast. You are dealing with spiritual warfare. Christians dance around, talk about knowing spiritual warfare, while the whole time the devil constantly beats them up on the playground and takes their lunch money, and yet they're trying to tell us they understand spiritual warfare. But we have times in our lives, guys, that are pivotal 
that if we'll flow with God, it opens up something new in our lives. And yes, if we miss that, you know, you can repent, and God will eventually take you around back to it, but it may never have the same intensity it did at that pivotal time. I want to go the first time around and go ahead and move in the full anointing, then have to repent and wander around the wilderness and go another round for another 40, you know, 40 years, and then get back in and maybe go half the anointing that I would have had if I'd have been obedient. We have to be sensitive to those times as such a time as this in the kingdom. Now, I want you to write this down. Those are the times of absolute abandonment to God. It's all or nothing. That's going to be part of the lifestyle of surviving the tribulation period. It's all or nothing. You can't be half in and half out. I guarantee you the first thing you're going to meet is a fence post. That's a Missouri saying. How many know you can't straddle the fence very long in Missouri without hitting a fence post? We need to understand that the divine rehearsals of the word, the feasts of the Lord, are divine rehearsals. That God is helping us remember something to prepare us for what he's going to do. Isaiah 46 and 10 says, God declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God tells us from the very beginning the end. You know one of the reasons I'm so big on the Sabbath? It is a divine rehearsal of the millennial reign of Christ. It's that seventh day rest. God will have his Sabbath. And a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So man has six days or 6,000 years that he gets to do things in the earth. And then God says, I'm going to have my day. And yet we have believers all the time skipping the Sabbath and then talking about the millennial reign. I'm saying, why do you think you're going to get the millennial reign if you never come to rehearsals? <laughs> it's like wanting to be a part of a wedding and never coming to the rehearsal. They may just set you down when you show up for the wedding. And the divine rehearsals, the, you see, the first time that Jesus came, he used the spring feast as the template of those divine rehearsals. And many of the Jewish people missed the point of what they were about. And they, they didn't understand that Jesus was following the feasts by the way he did things. You know what's amazing now? When Moses first gave the Torah to Israel, how many know it wasn't a yearly cycle? That was not until Babylon when they established the synagogue. Ezra and Nehemiah established a synagogue, and there they could hear it every week. They only heard the Torah read three times a year, so it took three and a half years to have an entire Torah cycle. How long was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years. He lived the word, the Torah, perfectly before them for the original cycle as given by Moses. And the Antichrist, when he comes, you know, you know he's not ruling and reigning the entire seven years of the tribulation period. It only kicks in the last three and a half. He doesn't get a day longer than Jesus had to do his stuff. And when Jesus came the first time, he was, he was walking in and fulfilling the spring feast. He is that Passover lamb. And the cross was the doorpost of the earth. In fact, many believe, both Christian and rabbinical believe, that Jerusalem is the gateway to this planet. And so God hung up his mezuzah on his doorpost and put his blood of the lamb over the doorpost and opened the door to the Holy Spirit to move freely in the earth. I don't know about you, but that's a lot to get excited about. So he was the Passover lamb. He was that unleavened bread come down from heaven. Jesus is the unleavened bread. When you look at a piece of matzah, it is striped and it is pierced. And could you imagine a Jewish person sitting there looking at the Lamb of God on the cross on Passover, him being striped and him being pierced and him not getting it? A lot of them did. It's because they didn't understand the purpose of the divine rehearsals. And then he was the first fruits offering. He rose from the dead sometime after sunset on Saturday night, and by Sunday morning, he was 
in heaven standing before the Father and giving a wave offering, Daddy, I got it done. <laughs> I am the first fruit of many brethren. He is that first fruits. Today we're standing at Shavuot, the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit wants us to have his fire in our lives for us to be that perfect witness in the earth of who Messiah is and so that we can gather in and mature the harvest in the last days. Does it make sense? When Jesus comes again, he's going to follow the pattern of the fall feast. The feast of trumpets is the rapture of the church. Now, if you really understand how that's going to work, we're going to get out of just a little bit of the tribulation period, about 10 days. About 10 days. Why is that? Because the Feast of Trumpets falls 10 days before the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is a divine rehearsal of the Valley of Armageddon. So we're caught up for a Jewish wedding. How long does a Jewish wedding last? 10 days. On earth, they're having the 10 days of awe that we're going to be gone and angels are going to be decreeing from heaven, you better get right. They're having their 10 days of awe. We're up in heaven going, wow, awe, for 10 days. And then we come back with him and we watch him kosher this planet because the day of, of, uh, the day of atonement was a divine rehearsal when Messiah comes back to judge a world that has rejected him. The Feast of Tabernacles. Almighty God Emmanuel comes in tabernacles among us and he rules and he reigns for a thousand years. And so, how many know that all these were known to Daniel? And Daniel was a walking supercomputer when it, when it came to Jewish things and he would calculate things out and try to sense prophetically. And he got to a place where he hit a closed door and he began to fast and pray and we pick up with this in Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. And he said, I heard, but understood not. Then said I, O oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. Kind of sounds like the body, doesn't it? The bride of Christ. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, he's trying to see, and he only has the seven feasts to work with, and he's trying to calculate all the things that are going on. I don't understand. It doesn't add up. My calculator doesn't work. You see, he was missing some pieces of the puzzle. Now, both Christian scholars and rabbinical scholars believe that there were two feasts that happened after Daniel's time. The Feast of Purim. How many know that happened after Daniel? And the Feast of Dedication happened after Daniel. He actually had two pieces of the puzzle that had not been established yet. And so he's, he's trying to figure out the puzzle. He's got two major pieces missing. And God says, you know what? It's not for you to have those two pieces of the puzzle. And now we have a body that is established in Messiah. We know that he was conceived during the Feast of Dedication and that he was most likely born during Tabernacles. We understand some things about Purim, that Purim is a type and shadow of the end times. It's Haman is a type and shadow of the Antichrist. And how many know that when Nazi Germany rose up, it was a dress rehearsal? How many know Satan has his dress rehearsals too? Hitler was a dress rehearsal for the Antichrist. In fact, he used to be a nobody. And Hitler was, I think, a corporal during World War II, or World War I, in the German army. He was a nobody. But then he was discipled, he was mentored by one of the leaders of the Thule Society, an occultic society that taught him how to move in occultic power. And before he became chancellor, he was, he was uh, infatuated with the uh, spear of Loginus, the spear of destiny. Now, it actually predates Christ a long time, but one of the things they tried to add to it was it was supposed to pierce the side of Jesus. No. But there is an occultic Babylonian 
significance of the spear of Lodgen is that whoever holds it can rule the world. And back then it was owned by the Illuminati and it was sitting down in Austria. And he would go down there and he would stare for it at hours, hours on end. And by his own testimony, he said, one day as I was staring at it, a spirit came out of it and entered into me. Why? He had been taught occultic secrets. And he raised from a nobody, tried to cause an overthrow. It didn't work. They threw him in prison. In prison, he writes Mein Kampf. And within just a little bit of time, he's the chancellor of Germany. And then you also find out another side of the story. Lester Summerall with Howard Carter were, were ministering in Tibet. The same day that Hitler became chancellor in Germany, all the Tibetan monks began to freak out. And, and they ask him, why are you freaking out? You know, you're, you're supposed to be the mellow guys going around going, oh, how come you're freaking out? And he said, all of our gods just left for Germany. Hitler was a dress rehearsal of moving the world to a place where it would move against the Jewish people. And part of it was to, to get Europe to become unchristian. And how many know today, Europe is not a Christian place anymore. They, they have left Christ behind. The Christian cathedrals are empty and being bought up by Muslims today. That was part of what the elite had in mind with World War II. You see, they understand dress rehearsals. Albert Pike, one of the founders of Freemasonry in America, along with Manzini, which took over the Illuminati from Weishoff in Europe and also founded a little organization called the Mafia, worked up a plan for them to get what they wanted done. They're, they're looking for the final dispot to come, the Antichrist to come. And for him to come, they worked up three plans to move the planet where they needed it. It was going to take three world wars, guys. Before the Civil War... They planned out World War I, World War II, and World War III. And in their own documents, they said World War III must be between the Jews and Islam. And it's going to make the world so sick of religion, it's going to lay everything aside except for the religion of the one to come. See, Satan has his dress rehearsals too. And Hitler, although he was half Jewish, decided to wipe out the Jewish people. How I many know he didn't quite get it done? And then there was something called the Nuremberg Trials. And when you look at the number of sons that Haman had, when he had prepared gallows for Mordecai and other Jews, it was that exact same number that the Nuremberg Trials decided to hang. And as the Nazis were marching up, this one Nazi captain looked up, and with eyes full of fear and astonishment, they were being hung on Purim. <laughs> and he said, my God, it's Purim, and we're Haman's sons. Because that was a dress rehearsal. How many know Nazism is on the rise again? It's on the rise again. It's not, and the Nazi party was not originally called the Nazi party. It was a socialist party. It used the platform of social justice and a lot of different things to, to establish itself. Do we see that pattern being repeated again around the world? And I, I, I think right now we have a lot of Jewish people that are in absolute shock because in, when the, there was a transition in America where we moved, I mean, like Harvard and all that back before World War II, there were called societal universities. There were societal colleges that, you, that certain families, if you were from, the fa from a certain family, you always got in. It didn't matter. There was no such thing back then as SAT scores and, 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 uh, and SAT scores and all that stuff. There, those didn't exist then. But after World War II, the intellectuals began to take over, and the Jewish community was a part of that. And they really promoted meritocracy. That meant you got, all, you got in based upon your merit, not upon your lineage. Because a lot of times the blacks and the Jews and others weren't allowed in those colleges except for a small percentage. But they didn't understand that there was a radical Haman element in the intellectuals. And the movement turned on them. I think we're getting ready to wake up one morning and we're going to find out a lot of Jewish people in America become conservative overnight. They're going to renounce their democratic 
position. They're going to do a lot of things. Because one of the things that we saw, remember the Occupy Wall Street movement? It was an anti-Semitic movement. Anti-Semitic. Uh, it's all the Jews' faults. Well, 99% of the guys that are they're raking all the money that caused the economic collapse weren't Jewish. It's just, it's just that, that spirit of Haman is beginning to work up, and I think a lot of Jewish people are beginning to, to realize what's going on. Because that divine rehearsal is getting to the place where it's not going to be a rehearsal anymore. Anti-Semitism is raising back up all across Europe. And one of the ones are saying, hey, I got a problem with this. Now get this, is Germany. Germany's going, uh, uh, <laughs> no. Why? Because for the last 15 years, on the anniversary of the end of World War II, there have been large congregations all throughout Germany get up and repent for the Holocaust, get up and repent for the atrocities and seek the face of God. Now we're seeing the rest of, the, uh, of Europe going in, into Nazism except for Germany. You say, well, I don't see Nazis anywhere. Have you looked at Greece? Well, the fascist, it's just called the Golden Dawn. It's a Nazi party. And they're beginning to do outreaches while Bloomberg, and we have those in, 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 in some of the bigger cities, did you know that restaurants can't just give food to the hungry? Because it has to be certified and have nutritional requirements met before you can give food to starving people. Now, isn't that stupid? If I'm starving, I'll take a peanut butter sandwich. I don't, I don't need a nutrition and a Coke, you know. <laughs> if I'm starving, but no, no, you can't feed them anymore. And now we're having the Nazi party coming up in places in New York and feeding the homeless. The rise of Nazism, guys. There are three major players in Esther. Number one, Haman is a type and shadow of the Antichrists. How many know when Jesus comes and defeats the Antichrist, it's because finally there is a Hitler that says, I have the final solution. We're going to wipe Israel out. And he marches all the armies of the earth into Israel. And they've got to go through the Valley of Armageddon to do it. His final solution. That's when Jesus comes back and intervenes. You have Mordecai. Now Mordecai, as I look at the book of Esther, I see that he is a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit, always giving wise counsel, helping position the bride, help moving Esther into the places that she needs to be and to give her wise counsel. And let me tell you something. There's going to be times in your life the Holy Spirit's going to say, listen, if you don't do it, God will raise up somebody else, but it will cost you. But maybe you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And Esther is a type and shadow, I believe, of the body of Messiah in the earth. As we look at this whole thing, well, Mike, I'm not Jewish. You are by adoption. If you're a Christian. We don't have our own Gentile tree. We were grafted into Israel. We draw from the roots of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, we have tried to make it a separate tree, but the only way you can do that is you've got to put on blinders and be blind to the word. We need to realize something in this last days. I need the Jewish people, and the Jewish people need the body of Christ to make this thing work in the last days. We need each other. There are elements that they have never understood about Messiah that we need to teach them, and there are some depths out of the Torah that we have not yet discovered that they need to share with us, and both sides have got a lot of repenting to do. We've allowed paganism in. They've allowed paganism in. Kabbalah is paganism. Acuba, you could take the origin of Kabbalah all the way back to Acuba. Rabbi Acuba christened another Messiah other than Jesus. His name was Simon Bar Kochba. 
He is the founder of Kabbalah. And he saw that there was this body of people moving under the Spirit of God, and he couldn't because he rejected Messiah. And so he pulled from what they had learned in Babylon to create a system that emulated the Holy Spirit. And every occultist in the world knows Kabbalah. In fact, Albert Pike that I mentioned a while ago in his book, Morals and Dogma, he said, this book right here is for idiots. It's all Kabbalah. Kabbalah is the way to go. You know what? You're an idiot because this right here is the way to go. This is God's eternal word and it starts in gener- gener- uh, uh, <laughs> I can say it in tongues. Genesis and goes on to Revelation. It's all his word and believer, the word of God didn't start in Matthew. It started in Genesis. We're all playing on the roof getting excited about the roof and you've never been to see the foundation. You better find out what everything rests on and learn how to rest on that too. There's a key for the bride to be effective and to facilitate God's purposes in the tribulation and learn how to survive. And it is absolute surrender to God. Learn absolute surrender now Rehearse it now so that it becomes second nature to you when it really means the most. When Jesus said, this is how you should pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In earth, what you made out of, Jack? You're not made, you're not made out of stuff they brought back from a, a satellite from Mars. You're made of earth. In earth. You see, if I can't get the will of God going here, I'm never going to get the will of God going out here. Every day I've got to learn to crucify my flesh so that I can move by what the Spirit of God is directing me toward. And one of the things that we're seeing, the spirit of Haman, the spirit of Antichrist, are hidden personal agendas. How many of us, if we'll be really honest with ourselves, it's your own agenda that gets you into trouble? Not somebody else's. It's your own agenda. Our own personal agendas are what are driving everything in the earth. Social justice. Well, they shouldn't have everything, even though they founded a business and gave 100 million jobs to people. They shouldn't have all the money. We should have the right to storm their house, take all their stuff, and we're going to be Robin Hood and just give it out to everybody. You didn't work for it. See, social justice sounds really good to the guy who didn't graduate high school, that never worked 40 hours a day in his life, that's learned how to live on welfare, now, I mean, no, welfare is okay if you need it. It's supposed to be a temporary measure. But we got to understand, at first it was developed not to help people, but to domesticate the American Indian. The system that they used to chill out and to control the Indian was the very basis for welfare in America. In fact, I'm getting ready to go up in April to a ministry in Canada that one of the, this apostle, one of his major things is to teach the American Indian, you don't live off the government. You get out, you work, God blesses your hands, you own property, that's very biblical. And he's teaching them how to quit being controlled by the man while they're at the same time saying, well, we just, you, know, you just need all this stuff because they, they, have, no, they have no gumption, they have no, uh, no sense of purpose. Living on a handout when you really need it is important. And how many know we're supposed to help those in need? But what's greater than even giving them a help in need is not just giving them a handout, but giving them a hand up. In fact, I think it should be directly linked. That if you're going to receive support and you're able to work, let's go ahead and get you the training to do something that you can really make something of your life. Find out what your giftings are. And we're going to increase your benefits as you go through school and then begin to wean them down after you're working and you can get your footing. But you know right now when you look at a social system we have in America, it's just the opposite. You're penalized for going to school. You're penalized. I know because we have worked with ministries that had begun to, to replace the stipends that they were getting from the government as they begin to decide to move out of that and get the education. 
You start getting educated, they start taking away your benefits. That's subjugation. Move out of that. You see, God wants better for you than you want for yourself. The only thing standing between you and your miracle is you. The only thing standing between you and the next level of God is you. If we learn to crucify our personal agendas, we can get into God's agenda, which is always better. It is always better. And that is what Esther had to do. She was in a situation. She was not summoned by the king to appear before him. And according to their law, if she went in uninvited, even though he was her husband, if he went in uninvited, she could be executed on the spot. And by their own traditions in Persia, everyone was expecting her to be killed on the spot. The king didn't do that which is normal when he responded. He did the uncommon thing by raising his scepter to her. But she had to completely abandon herself to God to be used at that crucial moment. And there are crucial moments in your guys' lives you've got to learn to be completely abandoned to God. What if I'm completely abandoned to God and I die? At least you died in faith instead of a coward. But how many know that really martyrs are very few in between? We see more that when they're, when they're totally abandoned to God in the word, they come out the other side victorious. I can even show you with Stephen. How many know that he, he in a sense, he gave his life for the Lord. But how does one kneel and pray and ask, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing when you're getting hit with stones? He saw the Lord and this earth couldn't hold him any longer. And it so moved a guy. There was, see, there was a guy as an official witness of the Sanhedrin to his execution. Saul of Tarsus was the witness. And he was going to continue that plight by getting, he had, he had documents to go to Damascus to take prisoners that followed Messiah. And you notice he didn't really argue. He, he knew something was up because he saw the stoning of Stephen and it just didn't quite look like a regular stoning to him. Something was going on with this. And so when Jesus knocks him off his donkey... Yes, Jesus sometimes will slap you upside the head if you need it. Knock you off something. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. How many know he didn't argue? Because he already connected it with Stephen. There was something already brewing in his spirit. That whole thing wasn't for Stephen's sake. It was for the Apostle Paul's. It was the first rung of God's plan to get him on the road to Damascus to turn him into an apostle for Messiah. So even that was a great victory, wasn't it? If it hadn't been for Stephen, we may not even have the writings of the Apostle Paul in the Word of God. God used his total abandonment for something great. But we need to understand that is the rare exception. You have Paul and Silas in jail and begin praising God, and God sets them free. You have Peter in prison, ready to be executed the next morning, and they set that he gets set free. You, you have over and over again God saving his people, God saving his people when they le- release themselves to absolute abandon to God. You're never going to know the full power of what could God can do in your life until you release yourself completely into his control. How many are tired of 10% miracles or 30% miracles or 40% miracles? We think, well, there's something wrong with God that, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to move to this 100% I see in the Word. The problem is the reason you're getting 30% is only you're only letting go 30%. And some people like Lester Summer and those that we have seen in the body of Christ that have done great things, they have released 100% to God. Whatever God said to do, they just did it with absolute abandonment. And they're our example. Esther's our example. 
learn how to move to a great place of victory by crucifying our own personal agendas and just completely surrendering to God. And I say that having lived a life, I mean, I'm kind of old. I'm, some of you guys think I'm still a spring chicken, but no. I'm in my 50s. That, to me, is starting to feel old, okay? Wyatt says, yeah, wait till you hit 70, you know. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hit 70 if the Lord tarries. But I can look back at a life that I've lived, even as a minister of the gospel, that the one that hindered God the most in my life was me. It wasn't the devil. It wasn't the guy down the street. It wasn't the circumstances around the corner. It was me, myself, and I. My agenda was contrary to the agenda of Messiah. And I hindered what God wanted to do because my head kept on getting in the way. My flesh kept on getting in the way. Mary and I, the other, we, we've said this several times, and I didn't feel like that, you know, back in the 90s when you're having people trying to kill you. And most of you know our story that we were beginning ministering to people coming out of the occult, and uh, we had people trying to kill us. And I mean, that really wasn't pleasant at the time. I felt like I was caught right in the middle of a Bourne movie or something, you know. But on the other side of it, who I became during that process... Mary and I were sitting one day and we said, you know what, the greatest thing ever happened to us was the day that witch crawled in the van to attack you. My daughter right there, she was in the van. Eyes about this big. Watched a witch transform into some ugly, muckly thing. You know, people's tongues are not supposed to stick out that far out of their mouth, okay? It was the best thing that ever happened to us. Because right after that, our agenda died. It began to die. Every day it began to die. And we began to move into God's miraculous. We've been poisoned. We've had people try to kill us. We've had assassins sent after us. We've had a vehicle that they took all the power steering fluid out of the, out of the vehicle and put in water so that your power steering seizes up on you when you're on the highway. We drove like that for six months, not even knowing that it was full of water. Walmart found it. Went in, and to show you the grace of God, that means, okay, I've got to get a new, you know, new, uh, new pump. You know, on. They went, flushed it out, and I drove it to the day we took it to the, to the junkyard. Every once in a while, I go, you know, but that's about it. And it was a big Ford Aerostar. The guy says, did you drive through a creek? And I said, no, I had to drive through a river to get water in that thing because it was high up off the ground. Never did it. We've had chases on the highway. We actually saw one day, we're driving down Old Country Road. It was, it was paved. You know, that kind of winds from a farm like this. And there's a semi coming down the hill and it loses control. And it's all over the road. And there's this huge ditches on both sides. So, I mean, it's like, you know, you better hope you can jump with the car. And I watched my wife pray, and I saw the hand of God come down and straighten up that semi and set it back right. And as the guy went past us, the only one who was more shocked than us was him. He drove by going, <laughs> as he drove by, because he had never seen it. It literally looked like this, like, like a hand come down and took a Tonka truck, straighten it back out and let it go on down the road. The reason we got to that because it was that day that the witch came in and we started learning the principle of complete surrender. There was one evening and you could just feel evil in the air. And we knew they were out in the field surrounding our house. I'm old military. So I went, got two shotguns out, had them laid, had them loaded, and I looked I look like Pancho. I, I had two things I was getting to put on with, you know, I can load them babies fast. I'm thinking, okay, chunk, chunk, it's time to play, you know. And I got two girls sitting in the floor saying, Dad, you're going to trust the shotguns, you're going to trust God. Unload, unload, unload. That's when Mike Lake realized he's, his agenda has got to die. That my hands, my life is in the hands of God. Either I trust him 100% or it's not going to work. In the days ahead, you have to learn how to trust God 
100%. And some of the little bumps in life that you're having right now is God is trying to teach you, just let go and let me. Just let go of your own agendas. Let go of, of your own flesh. And just let me be at the wheel and teach you how to flow in my spirit so that you can move against the impossible and get victory when you really need it. I believe every small problem that we have in life is God trying to teach us that lesson to let go. Learn how to be an overcomer. You want to learn how to do it before you're face to face with the Antichrist. <laughs> you want to learn how to do it before you're staring down the other at the wrong end of a barrel. You want to learn how to do it now in the little things as you go through these rehearsals every day in life to learn how to just flow in the kingdom of God. There was a guy named Nicky Cruz that as he held the gun at a man of God and began to pull the trigger and the bullets wouldn't fly right, and every time David Wilkerson said, I love you in Jesus' name. I love you in Jesus' name. Every time he pulled the trigger, how many know when that clip got empty? He gave his heart to Jesus. That may be cool on Nikki Cruz's side, but how would you like to be David Wilkerson? This far. You better learn how to have absolute surrender to God before you get there. That's the lessons that Purim teaches us. That the key to victory, the key to always make sure Haman ends up in his news is absolute surrender to God. And if I learn to do that, if you learn to do that, we're going to move in places of God no other generation has moved into because I believe we are that final generation before the Lord comes back. We're going to get to see everything from, from Genesis to Revelation all wadded up together. To include, to understand what's going to happen in the days ahead, you've got to take the book of Acts and take the book of Judges and put them together. Except the Judges are going to be apostles in the last days that are going to raise up and begin setting God's people free with miracles. Kind of makes me wish I was Apostle Samson, but, you know, <laughs> you know as far as the muscle part, well, my muscle dropped, but I'm not trusting in my long hair either, so... But we're going to have to change our worldviews. We're going to have to begin moving in line with God. Let God adjust you. Look at every opportunity you have in life, every problem that's going on, every situation. Say, Holy Spirit, use this to adjust me. Let this be a divine rehearsal for me to learn how to get this thing down of surrendering to you, following your voice, following your lead. Let you be as Mordecai speaking in the ear of Esther every day of my life so that I can do exactly what I need to do to position me for victory in life. That's the great part of Purim. Because we're going to have to put it into our equation of understanding the last days. And how I many know we're in the last of the last of the last days? Time's counting down. Well, Father God, I just ask you in the name of Jesus, Father, to give us your grace to turn everything over to your spirit. Father, give us your grace to totally live a life that is abandoned to the purposes of the kingdom of God. And we have crucified our own kingdom so that we can walk in yours. Teach us, Holy Spirit, every day to surrender and to follow your leading task. In Jesus' name. Father, we also pray.